Amen and amen. You may be seated. I'm going to dismiss our children as well downstairs. I just don't get it. You Christians talk an awful lot about the love of God. And then you tell me that if I don't believe in Jesus, I'll go to hell. A place of eternal torment? What kind of God are you talking about? He seems to be a moral monster. Why can't you just stick to the message of Jesus who accepted everybody? tax collectors and prostitutes, and who said, don't judge, lest you be judged. What's the issue? You ever heard a question like that? Kind of a familiar introduction to the question that we're taking a look at this morning in our series, Questioning Christianity. The question is this, if God is loving... How can he send anyone to hell? It's a difficult question. Matter of fact, Rebecca McLaughlin in her book, Confronting Christianity, admits this question is the most difficult. Every other question pales in comparison. It's a difficult one. It's uncomfortable. It gets us scratching our head, thinking, a little turmoil. There's a tension, a conflict that rises when we ask a question like that. If God is loving, how can he send anyone to hell? This question seems to highlight an apparent tension between the love of God and also the holiness of God, the love of God and the justice of God. How does the Christian answer this question? How does the Christian address such tension truthfully? And yet, as we've set a tone already in this series, humbly, gracefully. My hope is to do that with you today. I have eight biblical passages. It was like 40. At this point, I've narrowed it down to eight. Eight biblical passages for you. So please grab your Bible. Let's flip. Let's take notes. If you say, this guy's insane, I can't keep up, relax, follow on the screen. It's going to be okay. Eight different passages to help us interact with this. Again, amongst many, I have eight. And there are two biblical convictions that I want to present to you that we cannot compromise Two biblical convictions that we cannot compromise. Eight passages, two biblical convictions, and it is my hope to present to you one hopeful resolution to the apparent conflict. You with me? Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we ask for your spirit to be at work. Clarify for us who you are. Reveal yourself to us in our questions. Show us your glory. Show us where there is hope. And bring some kind of resolution to us from your word. May we all be attentive today. May you reveal yourself and nurture us in this time by your Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready? Biblical conviction that we cannot compromise. Number one, God is love and gives love 
toward the most undeserved people. Biblical conviction that we cannot compromise, number one. God is love and gives love toward the most undeserved people. Can I get an amen to that? Grab your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 to 8. This is the primary passage in this section, although if you want to flip, flip, flip with me, like, you know, master sword drillers, you can try to flip and follow along with the rest of them, okay? Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who were on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more than number that any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God is love, and he shows his love toward the most undeserved sinners. I'll show you more. Psalm 103, 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, don't even miss that word. You who are dearly loved, beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. Biblical conviction number one that we cannot compromise. God is love. And he shows his love toward the most undeserved people. If you see and interact with the story of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation... You will know, you will come to know a God that is love and that loves even those who deserve something else. R.C. Sproul said it this way Love is such an intimate aspect or attribute of the character of God that you can, in a manner of speaking, say that He is love. Any view of Him that neglects to include within it this profound sense of divine love is a distortion of who God is. The God that we worship, the God of the Bible, is a God of love. He is love. He is the definition of love. He is the one who demonstrates love, and he does so toward the most undeserving of people. Guys, sit for a minute and rest in that biblical conviction that we cannot compromise. It's easy to even think about it so conceptually, But if you just stop for a moment and let it sit, the God of the Bible is a God of love. And He loves, amen? And He loves you, the most undeserving of people. That's the God of the Bible. We will not in any way, shape, or form compromise that biblical truth. Let it set in your heart Let it take a hold of you even now that that is the Christian God. The Christian God is a God of love. He is love. And he shows that love to the most undeserving of sinners. Such an idea of God magnetically pulls us toward him, doesn't it? Magnetically pulls us toward him. We see a God of love And that draws us to him. And so, as we let that sit for a second, it draws us in. And yet, let's not forget our question. 
right? How God is loving, if that's true, if that's a conviction that we will not compromise, then how can he send people to hell? Well, he's not only loving. He's also holy. Turn with me to Isaiah 6. And again, picking one passage of a gazillion. You'll see that God is not only loving, He is holy. Biblical conviction number two that we cannot compromise. God is holy, and He justly punishes people for their sins. Isaiah 6, 1-5. through In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with the two He flew. And one called to the another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Isaiah speaking, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In this moment, Isaiah records a time in which he finds himself in the presence of a holy God. Isaiah becomes aware of his sin. And Isaiah understands the problem with that. Isaiah understands that as a man of unclean lips who lives among a people of unclean lips in the presence of a holy God, that he is doomed. He understands the gravity of his sin. He understands the reality of the holiness of God, and now he lives with an expectation of being ruined. Woe is me. Woe is me. He understands that God is holy. And because God is holy, the Scriptures teach that He will justly punish people for their sin and for evil. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5-10 says this, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. So now we have a holy God and we have a place of destruction and eternal punishment for those who do not know God and who have not obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That place of punishment, the Scriptures continually teach, where there will be eternal destruction and separation from God is known as hell. A real place of real punishment for real sinners. And you say, well, what about the red letters? What about what Jesus taught? 
without going into all the examples. I mean, we walked through Matthew together the last four years. If there's anything that we notice that time and time again, Jesus talks about this reality. And no one in the Bible talks more frequently about the reality of hell and eternal punishment than Jesus Christ himself. Hell is a real place of real punishment for real sinners. What's interesting is, you ask Americans, what do they believe about hell? 2022, the Pew Research Group did a study to find out what Americans, not Christians, Americans believed about hell. 60% of Americans believed in some kind of reality of hell, some concept of hell. Isn't that interesting? 60% of Americans. So they believe in some kind of reality known as hell. But while they believe in hell, whatever that means, the notion of judgment, the idea that God and His holiness would judge people for their sins and their evil and their wrongdoing is a deeply offensive concept in our day, isn't it? Judgment is offensive. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but at one point there was some Senate confirmation hearings taking place, and uh, Senator Bernie Sanders at that time was examining one of uh, the nominees, his name was Russell Vaught. He was nominated by President Trump to be the deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget. And the question that was constantly being asked by uh, Senator Sanders was this, do you think that people who are not Christians are condemned? And he kept responding, I'm a Christian. I believe in the teachings of the Bible. Do you believe that those who are not Christians are condemned to hell? I'm a Christian. I believe in the teachings of the Bible. And again, pressing and pressing, continually going toward this, Sanders concluded in these Senate hearings that he would not in any way, shape, or form vote uh, for him uh, for that position. I think it's reflective of the culture in which we live. Not to pick on Senator Sanders, but it's really a reflection of the culture that we're in. That people can conceive of a loving God, but never a God that is holy in such a way to punish people for their sin and wrongdoing. Now understand this, this is an American reality. Because in, at least Western reality, in Eastern parts of the world, uh, the, uh, the assumption is obvious that that you know, people are going to give account for how they live, and there'll be some kind of account for that on some kind of judgment day. But the expectation that there is a God, he's, he's righteous and holy and probably a judge that will keep you accountable for the life that you live. But in Western civilization, especially in America, there seems to be an aversion to that. It's offensive to think of a God who will judge. Well, offensive or not, we have a biblical conviction that we cannot compromise. While we embrace a God that is love and shows his love toward undeserved sinners, undeserved people like you and me, we also have another biblical conviction that we cannot compromise, that God is holy and he justly punishes people for their sins. And so as we interact with that conviction, it seems like the question flips. The question flips, if God is holy, how can he allow anyone into heaven? You ever hear that question? It flips it. The question being asked is, if God is loving, how could he send anyone to hell? But if we think about the holiness of God, we come to grips like Isaiah with his his transcendence and his perfections and his righteousness. And we come into into the presence of that God we begin to ask the question, if God is holy, how could he ever allow anyone into heaven? 
These are two convictions. These are two questions. And so right now we feel the tension. And we want a resolution to this tension. Right? We're, we're uncomfortable. We should be. And to be honest, I don't know if we're ever going to end with an answer this morning where everyone just feels super comfortable about the reality of hell and God's holiness. I don't think we're going to walk out of here and go, oh, I feel so much better now about hell, about God's holiness. But I do believe that the Scriptures point out to us a hopeful resolution. But before we get into that, I think that maybe as we hear these attributes of God lined up side by side, that maybe there's an option here that could bring some resolution. We have a loving God and we have a holy God. We have a God that loves undeserved sinners. We have a God that that punishes justly people for their sins. Maybe we could just pick an attribute that seems to outweigh the other one. Maybe we could choose one as kind of a trump card that makes the other one kind of fall to the wayside. So let's run with that for a second. Let's pick one. The love of God or the holiness and justice and righteousness of God. Let's pick one. Which one do you want? If you pick one, you're going to compromise the other. Do you want love? Or do you want justice? Pick one. Pick one as your trump card. You're already starting to feel the tension here, right? You're starting to feel the tension. Well, I don't know. I mean, of course, if we pick love, we're going to pick that, right? Like, Yeah, I'll take love for 500. (laughs) Um... But now we compromise justice. And I think about the societal crave for justice right now. Do we want to compromise that? Do we want to compromise accountability for evil actions? Would we want to compromise justice when we think about Adolf Hitler? We want to compromise justice when we think about Larry Nasser. We want to compromise justice when we think of Harvey Weinstein. Is that how you pronounce his name? I don't know. I should follow the news more. Do you want to compromise justice when we think about the grotesque atrocities in human history? Do we want love to be the trump card that gives everyone a pass? We don't want anyone to be held accountable for their sin and evil. I think we understand that to use the love of God as a trump card that seems to just put away any notion of judgment and justice makes some other very significant and important human longings to be left unmet. A loveless God is hopeless but a God that minimizes and trivializes and downgrades his justice leaves us in a hopeless place as well. Losing either love or justice leaves us in a hopeless position. Picking one or the other does not hopefully resolve any tension in the question. And even the way that it was presented is a little goofy and conflicted because You can't just pick one in the nature of God. When we think about God's attributes, we think about him like, yeah, he's holy, he's compassionate, he's loving. Like we almost think about it in a way that divides him into parts. But God is not able to be divided into parts. He's a simple being. He is all that he is always and perfectly. When we talk about his love, we're not separating it out from his holiness and his justice. We talk about justice, we're not separating it out from his his love. 
When we talk about the God of the Bible, we're talking about all of him, always and perfectly. Even the way I presented these biblical convictions, I separated them in, in distinct ways as if we can separate them out, but we cannot do that. He's simple. And so picking one or the other does not hopefully resolve the tension. We cannot resolve the tension either by collapsing God into a single attribute. That's Todd Pruitt. We can't do what Rob Bell did when he wrote his book, Love Wins, and said, hey, at the end of the day, love wins. Kind of embracing a Christian inclusivism. Yeah, Jesus was necessary. He was the demonstration of God's love. But here, at the end of the day, and on Judgment Day, God is going to make all that Jesus did apply to every single person, and everyone is included in that sacrifice, in that payment. But if you read the Bible at all, that is just simply inconsistent with what the Scriptures teach. We must be careful to not collapse God into a single attribute. Nor can we pit one attribute against another as though God is at war with himself. God is not conflicted. Amen? His attributes are not contradictory forces which must be balanced against one another. God is love, gloriously so, but he is also just. God is merciful and kind. He is also righteous and holy. Someone say amen to that. That's the God of the Bible. We cannot We must not collapse or pick one attribute over another. That is a fool's game. And so the only resolution I can offer to you this morning that gives us hope, that can somehow bring resolve to this apparent tension between God's love and His justice, is the cross of Jesus Christ. It is in the cross of Jesus Christ where love and justice intersect in a perfect harmony. Open your Bibles to 1 John 4, 9 through 10. Grab your pen, it's going to have you circle a key word. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Already we, we hear hope. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Take your pen Pencil, whatever, your Apple pen. Is it a pencil? I don't even know. Take it and circle, highlight, underline, you know, point arrows to it. Propitiation. Propitiation. That's the word that we cannot miss, and it is connected to the real biblical definition of the love of God. If you want to know the love of God... You have to interact with the reality of his hate. You say, wow, that's a strong statement. If you truly want to understand the love of God, you must interact with the reality of his hate. Where do you see that? In that word propitiation. Well, I'm tired of the big theological words. Well, let's talk about it. Propitiation. It means this. Wrath-absorbing sacrifice. God in His holiness justly pours out His wrath on sin and sinners. There's His holiness. Because He does not delight in wickedness. Sin is an abomination to Him. He hates it. It must be punished. And a propitiation is a wrath-absorbing sacrifice. What John is saying is that Jesus is the propitiation. Jesus' death 
becomes a wrath-absorbing sacrifice where the holiness, the justice, the righteousness of God is fully satisfied and poured out on him. He becomes a substitute payment for us. That is love. He gives himself up freely, voluntarily, on behalf of sinners. He provides what is necessary to save us from our sins. He absorbs all of the holy, righteous wrath and indignation that is justly given towards sin on the cross in our place. That's what propitiation is. God poured out all of his wrath on Jesus, satisfying his holiness and also securing love for sinners like you and me. That is the gospel. That is love. That is holiness. Propitiation. That brings resolution. That answers the question, how can a holy God welcome anyone into heaven? In and through Jesus Christ. My wife and I were talking about this message on the way home from Cedarville this week, and I was dealing with all this the way I do, and she just said, listen, it's simple. The one resolution that we find in the scriptures between love and holiness is Jesus. Jesus. And in that statement, and in that simplicity, she basically was including all that he was and all that he did for us as a propitiation, a wrath-absorbing sacrifice that took on the wrath of God. Ligon Duncan says this, Even though God is a God of infinite love, he does not show mercy at the expense of his justice. So propitiation is the way that the loving God shows us mercy justly. Praise be to him. Propitiation is not something that we provide to God, amen, to get right with him again. It is something that God provides to us that we may be justly and mercifully forgiven and accepted, and he does this at his own expense through the loving gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Sin must be paid for. And the unbelievable truth of the gospel is that Jesus paid it all. He paid the penalty that we owed. He absorbed the wrath that we deserved. And now Romans 3 tells us this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's us. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that what? He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's where love and justice intersect in a hopeful, resolving way. It does not make us feel more comfortable about the the gravity of hell in any way, shape, or form. But it does provide us a solution to the tension of a holy God that uh, uh, can welcome people into his heavenly kingdom. It does point a way whereby sinners like you and me can be saved from the wrath of God. It is in and through Jesus Christ. There is only one hopeful resolution to the apparent tension between God's love and justice, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. There is nowhere else to look. There is no other place to go. There is no other remedy for this tension. It is in Christ. And in His cross, it is in His death, that love is on full display and justice is perfectly served on behalf of sinners. But this is not automatic. It is not automatic. Romans 3 tells us it is to be received by faith. It is to be received by faith. He is just and justifier of the one who has faith in who? 
Jesus. You see, the Bible does not convey any kind of universalism. Everyone will be saved from hell. It does not convey any kind of Christian inclusivism, again, like Rob Bell would want, that everyone is saved in and through Jesus, whether they believe it or not. I even had an interaction with a neighbor recently where he, he's like, at the end of the day, I think everyone's going to be saved through Jesus. That's an easy way to, to resolve the tension. But it's not the way the Scriptures teach. And it is false. It's not automatic. This love, demonstrated by Jesus on the cross, it must be applied to you personally by God the Holy Spirit. It's not automatic. It must be applied to you. And it is applied to you and is, must be received by you in faith. You must see Christ in all of his glory, all that he's done for you, and say, that's my hope. That's my salvation from hell. That's my salvation so that I can be in the presence of God forever. It must be in Jesus. You must turn away from yourself. You must walk away from your deeds. You must turn away from your foolish assumptions that everyone's just going to be saved. You must turn away from your sense of entitlement to God's mercy and love. You must turn away from that, and you must turn to Jesus in faith. You must have total reliance and dependence upon him and his finished work. And if you do this, if you see Christ and you trust in Christ, the scriptures are clear. You are justly saved. You are justly receiving mercy from his hand. And his payment is sufficient. And you will live with an expectation of heaven. That's what the scriptures teach. So receive Jesus by faith today. See him in his all-satisfying work. See his love and his, and his mercy and his compassion. He gave himself for us to save us. That's where the hopeful resolution lies. The intersection of holiness and love is in the cross of Calvary. Look to him. Trust in him. And rest with the assurance of 1 Thessalonians 5. It's not destined us for wrath, but salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? If you receive Jesus, you can live with the expectation to be received in heaven. If you receive Jesus by faith, you'll receive what you want. You'll live with such hope for heaven. You will live with the anticipation of God's presence, of seeing Jesus face to face, to be a citizen of his kingdom, and to enjoy eternal paradise with him. Isn't that an amazing hope that we live with? But understand this. If this is not enough for you, if Christ is not sufficient for you, if you do not believe in him, if you ultimately reject him, guess what? God will give you what you want to. He'll give you a life and eternity of a godless existence, separated from his presence. C.S. Lewis said there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, Thy will be done. In the end, everyone gets what they want. We live a godless life rejecting Jesus. You'll have a godless eternity rejected by Jesus. But if you accept Him and you trust Him, and you see him in all of his glory and the sweetness of his salvation. You will be his, and he will be yours forever in heaven. That's the Christian hope. That's what we live with. And all the tension that we feel as we interact with a simple God of love and holiness and righteousness and compassion and mercy and all of those things, all that we feel trying to figure out such a difficult question like this. We see that God understood that tension. And he did what was necessary to save us from his wrath. 
and to bring us into relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. So see him, trust in him, embrace him by faith, abandon every other hope, every other answer to this kind of question, and walk into the loving arms of your Savior this morning and trust in him. Because he is, and his death is, the one hopeful resolution to the apparent conflict of God's love and justice. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in awe, in awe of your holiness and in awe of your sacrificial, self-giving love. We praise you for Jesus, the one who came willingly, submitting to your will, O Father, and giving himself over in life and in death to bring about your redemptive purpose to save a people from their sin for yourself. Lord, I pray that there's anybody here today that has heard the gospel, the good news about Jesus for the first time. I pray that your spirit would draw them and they would see him, they would trust him. And I pray that if there's any confused, uh, conflicted saint trying to figure out who you are in the midst of their life and in the midst of what they're dealing with, I pray that you would encourage them with your love, that you would encourage them in your perfections, and that they would once again see the glory of the cross of Jesus Christ, that they would turn away from their self-reliance and continue to run in full dependence upon Jesus. Encourage us in him. Give us all hope in him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.